My name is John O'Brien. I'm superintendent of schools. Uh, we started this process almost a year ago. Uh, the, the board was noticing maintenance costs and they were starting to go up, not starting to, they were already going up and doubling. And so they said we needed to go look into some things. So that's when we went out and we hired a few folks to get them in here, uh, namely our committee uh, person came in. But let me give you a few highlights about Van Lake ISD uh, that you may not know. Van Lake ISD, all of our campuses and the district have met standard for numerous years, as well as our high school has been named best high schools by U.S. News and World Report for a couple years. Uh, our financial rating with the state, the first first rating is superior achievement. It's been that way since they came out with that system. So we do a very good job with our monies and our taxpayers' monies. Last year's enrollment was 1,030 students. As of last Friday, we're at 1,040. Uh, average age of our buildings is 57 years old, with the oldest one being 78 years of age. That is ERUD Intermediate. Uh, some, some folks believe that that building is a historical building. It's actually not. There's a historical marker in front of that building, but that historical marker is for the district, not for the building. Van Leck ISD, the last time we constructed an entirely new campus, was in 72 and 73. That was the elementary school and the ag shop. That was also the last time a bond was passed in the district. Give you a few highlights on school finance. First of all, it is a very, very difficult system to learn. It, it is ever changing. If you were to ever put the formula for school finance on a piece of paper, it would take about 20 or 30 pieces of paper to write out the formula. There are many factors that are involved in it. Maintenance and operation, M&O, which is your day-to-day, everyday budget that we use to run our schools, is currently at a tax rate of 101. This revenue pays for salaries, utilities, routine maintenance, and other day-to-day -day operation. It is state regulated. INS, or interest in sinking, otherwise known as bond money, we have zero at this point. We have no debt in this. Revenue from this tax is what the district would use to pay for a bond program. Also, you cannot use this for reoccurring costs like salaries, utilities. In other words, you can't use INS for everyday budget items. And then the other thing about INS is it stays in the system. It stays here in the district. It doesn't go back to the state. Bond planning process. This started a few months back. There was about 29 members, these are community leaders, parents, teachers, that were represented a cross-section of the district. We held seven meetings starting in March of 2017, ended in June 2017. They looked at a lot of different information. They analyzed all the facilities, they toured all the facilities, they heard presentations from district leadership and in industry professionals, as well as they looked at demographics, school finance, and technology. On June 28th, they presented a recommendation to the Board of Trustees, and then the Board of Trustees took turns, excuse me, board members took turns attending the different meetings, and then on the 28th, they approved the committee's recommendation unanimously and called for a bond election on November 7th. So what is in the bond? New elementary school, new middle school, new high school, transportation, and renovation. Those renovations are renovations to the gym and auditorium complex, the stadium complex, and the ag facility. So the elementary school, originally built 72-73, E-RUD was 38-39, and what we're going to do, our hope is, if the bond passes, we'll combine those two schools into one school, pre-K through 5. So that will help us in the district going from four campuses to three campuses. Okay? We identify the needs as best as under VCT flooring and the ceiling tiles up above, as well as in E-RUD, 
a lot of wood structure. Uh, there are no fire suppression systems anywhere in the district except in the kitchens. Okay? And with a wood building as old as that one is, it would fire suppression system would be nice to have. All the water lines are beyond their life expectancy. Maintenance is constantly dealing with pipes that have either collapsed or that break when they have to snake them, as well as old equipment that is hard to replace as well as maintain. And then, of course, there are accessibility items at all, both of those campuses when you're talking about ADA. And then outdated electrical panels. It is very hard to add electrical items on those two campuses. What we're looking at is a pre-K through fifth grade campus. <coughs> Elementary students will now be served by one facility, reducing the number from four to three. Next generation learning spaces office space, custodial classroom, science labs, special ed space, library, music rooms, cafeteria with stage, and a new gymnasium for PE. That's elementary school. And if you've seen these drawings, which I'm sure most of you in this room have, these are conceptual drawings. These aren't designs. That won't happen unless the bond is passed. And then a committee will design the buildings. O.A. Turner. Originally constructed in 48-49, with the 6th grade wing happening in 1990. If you remember, before the 6th grade wing, it was a shop area. It burned down, and then the school built uh, the 6th grade wing in 90, and the band hall in 96. Four graded parking areas causing water infiltration into the building, as well as the building is sinking. If you go to the building and walk around the outside, especially in the older part of the building, the building is dropping below grade. We've even gone in there and pulled dirt away from the building to help with water flow, but it still gets into the library spaces and that older part of the building. Again, water lines are past their life expectancy. No fire sprinkler system, only in the kitchen. There's asbestos in the building. Uh, kitchen and cafeteria are too small. One of the biggest comments that we always get when engineers or architects or even the committee when they came in there and they haven't seen the junior high in a long time is they are amazed at how the ladies can put out lunch for all those folks. And so it's, it's truly, it's truly uh, amazing how they do it in such a small kitchen area. And then of course the gymnasium needs some renovations as well. What we're proposing, a new campus, 6th through 8th. It will helpfully reduce the maintenance and operating costs with a new facility, next generation learning spaces, office, custodial classroom, science lab, special ed, library, art room, band hall, cafeteria with stage, and then a new gymnasium for boys and girls and dressing rooms. That would be the middle school. Again, conceptual drawing. But that's basically what we're looking at. There were some concerns by, oh my God, the kids are going to be too close to the highway. Well, that's not a concern because we can route those kids any way we see design. We can come out the back way. We can come out the side way. We can still come out the front with parents because junior high kids don't drive. So there's multiple ways to do that. But again, that will come in the design phase. They will take all those things into consideration and look at that. High school, originally built in 58. It's had various renovations over the years, 73, 80, 85. The roofs, at least 50% of the facility are hurting in that facility. Roofs are an issue all throughout the district. All of our roofs are out of date except for two sections. The U-shaped section around what they used to call the old patio at the high school, that is uh, within its warranty as well as the science wing is within its warranty. The rest of the roofs in the, in the district are out of the warranty. That means they're older than 25 years of age. Okay? Again, sanitary sewer lines, water lines are all past their life expectancy as well as hot and cold in some areas of the building. Mechanical rooms are in bad shape. And again, it has to do with the humidity in this area, just the age of them. Fire suppression system, there isn't one and then security, vestibule. That building is tough because the front office cannot see the doors where the kids come in or where people come in from the pub. 
We have cameras, but that doesn't always catch everybody. What we're proposing is kind of behind the ag shop in that area, going up to the up to the highway. But again, conceptual drawing. So that may not be the exact design. 9th through 12th grade, next generation learning spaces, again, offices, custodial, science, computer labs, special ed, library, art, band, black box theater. Does everybody know what a black box theater is? It's a small drama classroom. Okay, it holds about 25, 30 people in the audience, but it allows them a full UIL stage in that classroom. So that way they can have their drama classes which Ms. Smith has a full day of drama classes, and that will allow them to stay on this side of 2540 and won't be crossing the highway. We have a lot of crossing the highway over here where they cross back and forth from the high school over to this area where the auditorium is. So during the school day, they may be able to use the black box here as well as you have a cafeteria on site and do gymnasium with boys and girls, locker rooms, dress, dressing rooms, and weight room. That will help us with the problems at the field house. As you well know, the field house is pretty out of date. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, there's a video floating around on Facebook right now that uh, shows all the different items in the district that are a worry, and that shows part of the field house, and that field house is a concern, a health concern too as well. Transportation, eight school buses. There was some concern by some folks about why would we do a bond for 25 years for a school bus? Well, we wouldn't. Okay, bonds can be purchased usually in five-year increments. So if you were going to do financing for a bus through bonds, you would do it in shorter increments, fives or tens, and then that way you're not paying it off for 25 years. So that was an issue that is quickly dispelled. And again, our financial guy, Mr. Wilkes, is here this evening. You can ask him those questions too as well. The renovations, renovate the existing auditorium, gymnasium, existing stadium complex, and ag facility. So here's the breakout. When you look at the total bond, 25% for a new elementary school, 25% for a new high middle school, 38% for a new high school, 11% for renovation, 1% for transportation. There's the money breakdown. Okay, that was option E, which is what the committee chose. And if you look on there, you can see dollar amounts. Now those dollar amounts may fluctuate a little bit, but for the most part, those are the percentages when you talk about those percentages. Okay? Some other important information that you may want to, you probably already heard about, but when you talk about a total bond package, the nice thing about our bond package is that we have a very large industry right next to us that is inside of our school district. When you combine all of the industry in our school district, 69% will be footing the bill for this bond. We could not afford it without our industry. Okay? 23% will then go to the single family residents. And then you have those other smaller figures there with vacant lots, mobile homes, those folks. 69% of 88.2 million comes out to about 60 million. So as you well know, $88.2 million is what we're asking for. Estimated tax impact for 125, a house that is one, or a property that is 125, appraised at, realized that that is our average home in Van Lake ISD. That comes out to about 24.44 per month or 85 cents a day. Okay, for that person that has that. If you're a little more, if your property's valued a little more, of course, it's a little more. If it's a little less, it's a little less. If you're over 65 years of age and you have your homestead exemption on your property, you will not see a tax increase. Your taxes should be frozen. I cannot, and neither can the district, control property values. That comes out of the county and the state. 
And so if you're worried about your appraised values are too high, you need to schedule an appointment with Mr. Maloney in, in Bay City. Frequently asked questions. These are all on the website, and we've given these out to folks. But these are a lot of questions that people ask. Okay, like, what are the tax rates of other school districts in the county? And this one is actually incorrect for Bay City. That was last year at 133. They're actually at 143 today, and they still haven't added in all their bond. So they will probably be well over $1.50. Okay? Now, let's talk about the impact on us in Van Vleck. If the bond were to pass, you will not see the full 40 cent impact right away. It only goes towards the debt services. So as you gather debt, you will add pennies. And as you all are all aware of, we don't set our tax rate until August and September. So let's say the bond passes in November. Come January, you're not going to see this huge tax hike. In August and September, when we set our tax rate, we will set our INS tax rate to take care of our debt services for that year. And then the next year, it'll happen again. And the next year, it'll happen again. And slowly, but eventually, you will get up to 40 cents higher than it has been. Okay? The 40 cents is the key. There's a lot of things floating around out in the public, like 40% tax hike and all that business. That's incorrect. Okay, that's misinformation. Okay, that is not, your total taxes are not going to go up 40%. That's wrong. And so, please do the math before you believe some of that signage. Uh, but all these questions can be answered here. One of the nice things about the way we, uh, we figured our tax rates for everybody is, and let's see if I can find it on here. Oh, Randy. <laughs> There we go. See that right there? Y'all may have seen that number on a sign out there talking about 88.2 million turning into 142 million. Okay? If somebody walks up to me and says, hey John, how much did you pay for your truck? I'm going to tell them, oh, I pay about 38,000, 40,000 for it. I don't tell them it took me five years to pay it off and I really paid 60,000 for it. Okay? Whenever you get a bond, it's just like getting a loan. And you have to charge interest on that loan. So therefore, you're going to get charged interest on a bond. So how does that get paid for? That 40 cents covers that. We're not going to come back to you 10 years from now and go, hey guys, we've got to pay for the interest. It's all part of that 40 cents. So understand that. But also understand, 4.5 is very conservative. Right now, bond rates are going anywhere from 2.8 to about 3.4. That's a lot different than 4.5. 4.5 is very high and very conservative. And we chose a number that was very conservative just for the fact that we could show you numbers. Okay? But please understand, when you see those things, <coughs> make sure you understand all the information. And that is our job here at the district is to give you all the factual information so that you can make a good informed decision when you do vote. Because we can't tell you to vote yes or no. But we can tell you, here's the information, you go make a decision. If you want to see copies of this, they're on the website. If you don't have access to it on the website, just give me a holler. I'll be more than happy to print a copy for you. So we've had four town hall meetings and we're having our fifth one now. And so that next checkbox will be checked off after tonight. And all I can ask you to do is get out and vote. If you haven't already registered, well then you're in trouble because it's too late. Because <laughs> it was due on October 10th. Uh, again, all that information can be found on the website. It's all there. It's all there black and white. Early voting did start today. And it will go through November 3rd. It's 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the service center in Bay City. Or, if you feel like driving flashes, <laughs> you can go to the county annex and flashes. Uh, I don't know why they have it there, but they do. So. Uh, and then, election day, of course, is on Tuesday, November 7th.
That's where you can vote if you live in those areas. So you look for your precinct and see where you vote. If you live down Cedar Lane, it's down the community center. If you live near Wadsworth, it's in Wadsworth, of course. Sergeant's Fire Station, Van Lex Community Center. And then if you live close to Old Van Lex Road up near the movies, you would go up to the Fellowship Hall there on Nickel Street. And again, there's where it is online, and then that's my name and my number. So if you have any more questions after tonight that don't get answered tonight, you're more than welcome to call or come by. I had a visitor this afternoon. And that's it for me. So now I open it up to you guys if you have any questions. Yes, sir. Hey, John, I, I think it's good for the audience to understand the usable tax rate that Van Black ISD currently sets against the rest of the school districts in the state of Texas and what the school bond would put us in as far as the category goes. I know Mr. Wilkes has that information, and I think that would be good for people to understand the impact. And I think the question you're asking is... Where are we at against the other school districts? There you go. Okay. Right. Where would we when you, when you just look at our M and O tax rate in the state, we're in the <clears throat> bottom 19 schools in the state of Texas. Okay, everybody got that picture? And for usable, I think we're the third from the bottom. We're at fourth, fourth, fourth from the bottom. And then when you talk about usable tax, just like John was saying, we're fourth from the bottom. So out of that many, <clears throat> over a thousand school districts, we're very, very, very low on the total pole. John, uh, do you get a special uh, bond rating, like AAA bond rating, because the permanent school fund underwrites Correct. the bond? Is that true? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the permanent school fund doesn't underwrite the bonds, uh, but the permanent school guarantees the bonds. And because of what Mr. O'Brien talked about earlier, the good financial uh, history of the school, the first ratings, academic ratings, you're eligible then to apply to the Permanent School Fund Bond Guarantee Program. It's 27 to $30 billion of assets that are out there to just to guarantee school bonds. And uh, you'll get the guarantee, we'll go issue the bonds with the AAA rating due to that guarantee. Is, so, it, is it true that, that the Permanent School Fund has never had to pay for a bond? I don't know if they've never had to pay for a bond. I'll ask my bond counsel back here, Tom Sage. That's correct. We've got you surrounded. The, uh, <laughs> uh, that's correct. The permanent school fund has never had to draw off on a default uh, school fund. So it's pretty good insurance. That's why your bonds are so, uh, will, will be uh, so, uh, and bond holders, holders will be anxious to get a hold of your bonds because they will have that PSF guarantee. They'll be triple A rated. They'll be as good a bond as anywhere in the United States, better than most. And that's why individuals and companies and financial institutions all over the world, uh, all over the country for sure, want to have PSF bonds. It's good best. Yeah. Any other questions? And John, I want to make sure that people understand that $88.2 million <coughs> bond the way the signs that are out here in this area that we see the 142 million would be assuming that we would pay that 88.2 million we buy the bonds all at once and we would pay that for the entire 25 years that is not how the bond works correct correct they're not they're not purchased that way they're purchased as you need them okay and then and then also they're purchased at different lengths different time periods and we're just like i said earlier with buses you might buy those in shorter bonds and so also, too, you don't buy it all at the same time. And so it's not going to impact the district at the same time, as well as it's not, it's not going to add up to 140. Yeah, so the 142 is the extreme worst case scenario if we bought it all at the same time. Correct. At 4.5%. At 4.5%. Okay, thank you. The other question we've seen is there was a, um, some uh, paperwork that went around recently that said that the assessment of the school situation was not done by certified engineering people. And I don't think that was was uh, correct. That's correct. So can you talk about that a little bit? Well, not, we have Mr. Bailey here. You want to speak up here? Yeah, my name's Ron Bailey with uh, PBK Architects. And 
we were involved in the facility assessment uh, of all the buildings. Now, I'm a registered architect. I'm not a structural engineer or a mechanical engineer or a plumbing engineer. So when we do a facility assessment, we have those folks come in and join the assessment team. And so, yes, we had uh, certified electrical engineers. We had certified mechanical, that's the air conditioning, certified plumbing. We had structural engineers come in and take a look. All of them took their own expertise and looked for the items that they were, that they were looking at. We looked at the architectural for codes, uh, handicap accessibility, and things like that. So, no, absolutely, we had uh, licensed engineers, uh, as well as licensed architects, take a look at the, the facility. Over a 25 year period, there's no way that I can see you logically figuring the percentage rate on your bond today, five years from now, ten years from now when one of these good gas companies or other industries you're talking about leaves. What are you going to pay ten years from now? Six. What are we going to pay on the interest rate? What is the bond going to pay? What does it cost us 3% today? And I believe you have a period of 2.5 or 5 percent, correct? Over the period? <coughs> no, what is sure. the period? What's the price going to be in two years? Well, the bonds when they're issued, they may be issued over two or three year period. They may not be all issued at once. We're assuming in our numbers that they're all issued at once at four and a half percent. Current market today is probably three to three and a quarter. So, once they're issued, though, they're fixed for the life of the bond. So they don't change. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yes, sir. We're all depending on industry. We've got one set next to us. Yes, sir. What happens if they go bye bye in 15 years? Uh, that, that's a possibility. What happens I mean, then to the tax? The money? I mean, the tax, the tax money, and I mean, I don't know, you can answer this too, Tom. I mean, Lewis, if you want to, but the assumption becomes on us, the taxpayers. So yeah, I mean that's that's a legit question. I don't think it's a reality question, but it's a legit question. The property still going to be assessed. Whoever owns the property, that's correct. Time, time may not be the same amount they're paying now, but someone is going to own that property regardless of if it's parents does or not, and they're required to pay taxes. Right. You want to say something? Sure. Um, Tom Sedgwick, Bob Cannon, Council. Uh, Tom, Council. It's a good question. Uh, for for Tom, 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 Tom
Uh, has our maintenance staff done a good job with 60-year-old buildings? They've got them in the last 60 years, and they're probably going to last a few years longer. Okay, so I think they've done a real good job. The biggest problem is, is not the amount of maintenance guys, but the biggest issue is, is there enough money to keep fixing? That's why you keep seeing band-aids. And so that's the biggest problem is we can't go in and fix. If the, if the chiller system goes down in this building, we're in a huge bind because it's going gonna, it's gonna to completely implode the maintenance budget. There's not enough money in the budget. And understand something with m and budget, day-to-day -day operating budget. The state of Texas says, you have this many kids, this is what your budget is. Anything more than that goes back to the state of Texas. So much that's called kids, right? Correct. Okay, and so that's because we're considered a rich school district. Okay, the state considers, considers us that. So therefore, we only get X amount of money. So that X amount of money has got to go to salaries, buses, maintenance and operation, all those things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. So please understand that they do a really good job, and that's a great question. Are they going to be able to handle new facilities with new equipment? And my answer to that is yes. But they are going to need training to handle that new equipment. So it's a good question. John, if, uh, if you've got new buildings, you have less money to spend on maintenance. <coughs> so would that yeah, it would help the other go down some because you don't, you don't have to maintain all these crummy buildings? It could. Good. Yeah, especially when we set the tax rates. And again, with property values going the way they are, it probably would lower some. Yeah. Any other questions? Hey, John, on some recent uh, accusations, it was uh, stated that the uh, potential wind farm that was coming to Matagorda County was already included in our assessment for industry. I'm pretty sure that's not correct because you can't do anything that's not built yet. Can you clarify that for people? Yeah, just, just so you may have heard or may not have heard, there's a potential wind farm. It's called Payton Creek Wind Generation Plant. It's down on 521, half of it being in our school district, half of it being in Bay City School District. It's a $250 million project. Okay, and the reason they picked that area is because of the proximity to the power lines that come out of SDP because in the state of Texas, the grid system doesn't get a choice on whether they buy or they don't buy. So if they generate electricity, it has to, they have to pay for it. So that's why they did proximity down there. The nice thing about that is, if it were to happen, and if it does happen in the future, right now, it's not part of any of our equations. It's not in there. If it does happen, it's icing on the cake. It helps improve our property values. And if property values go up, it takes less pennies to generate that $88.2 million. Okay? So everybody understand it. The higher our property values go up, the lower those pennies have to be. So that actually helps us. Okay? Any other questions? I got one last one, John. Uh, people get confused when they talk about their tax value of their property. Correct. When we talk about school taxes, People assume that you're taxed at your current property value. Can you explain the school tax and, and so everybody understands it's not your property value? Correct. The county or the county assessor assesses you appraised value for your property. Okay, but for school tax purposes, there are exemptions involved. Let's just take a hundred thousand dollar piece of property. Okay, the county's appraising at a hundred thousand. But the property for school tax purposes is actually fifty-five thousand. So there's a considerable difference between that appraised value and what the school district uses for their. Now again, that's with exemptions. Okay, so you got to have those in place. And so if you didn't apply for exemptions, boy, you better. Okay, because that'll help. You. And, and and the biggest thing you know, I visited with with a citizen today in my office. Really good conversation. But a lot of people. Or not a lot of people, but there's some folks that believe, you know, why are we doing this? You got to understand something. We know there's a need there. There is no doubt there is a need there. But please know that our, our school board, our school administration fought long and hard before we went into this process. Because of the fact that we're in a time in our history 
and Van Vleck that we are fixing to be in a window where our appraised values are going to be at an all-time high. And so that's why we want to strike now and do it at this period of time because as Tenaris or any other industry that were to start up right now, their value is going to drop off after a while. And that's why we want to hit it at their highest value. Because even as of today, the plant sitting next to us is not at their highest value. They will be at their highest value about 2019. Okay? So that's, you got to understand why now, is why now has two factors. Aging facilities that we're having a very hard time maintaining with our M&O budget. And secondly, the window of opportunity is right now. And so we don't want to miss out on that opportunity. Okay? Any other questions? Uh, John, what, uh, what does it take to pass a bond? I think I was thinking in Texas it takes 50% plus one vote. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. 50% plus one vote. Plus one. Yeah, you, you can win a bond election with one vote. Any other questions? Please? Yes, ma'am. I think there's also a misconception on the fees and what role the chosen architect would do. Well, and, and good question. I, I had that question too as well. That, that was a question brought up to me. First of all, the school district has not chosen an architect for this project. Okay? Please understand that. We have used PBK to help us in the assessment phase. Okay, but at this point, PDK hasn't got a red cent from us. They're doing this gratis work. Yeah, correct? Correct, yeah. And, and so what will happen is, after the bond passes, if it does, then the board will come to me and we will go out and go out for bids for an architect. And then I'm sure PDK will put in a bid because they know our facilities very well as well as others. I know there was a gentleman that called me today, I believe from Claycomb, that said they were going to be here tonight. I don't know if he's here. I don't see any faces. But I know they're going to probably put in a bid too. And I'm sure SHW and some other large firms in the state. So as far as architectures, arch architects, we don't have one yet. And that'll go out for bids if the bond passes. So now, once you hire that person and we accept their bid, now I'll let Ron talk a little bit. What what is the usual fee for an architecture firm? Yeah, um, there are several ways that uh, architects are paid for um, doing design and and aiding through construction and so on. Sometimes it's a um, uh, well, the majority of it is percentage of construction. Sometimes it's a fixed fee, but I will say that the pretty much a standard is a percentage of construction uh, fee and um, that's that's the way we work uh, and that's the way most of the other school architects work as well okay. oh and it's only on the construction cost um, you may see you may think that the uh, 88 million two hundred thousand well gosh it must be a percentage of that no it's not that number has what we call soft costs already built in <laughs> Because you have to have furniture for that, uh, you have to have equipment, you have to have technology, and then also the rest of that soft cost is um, professional fees. Not only architects, but engineers. Now, I mentioned before that we had engineers come out. Um, when the actual design starts, then we would use engineers as well, so they, they have to get paid too. So it's not a, that entire amount. It, it's on a percentage less. And, um, you might want to explain that you would be involved monthly in the draws and everything. So you would be inspecting the work of the general contractor. Oh, yes. In fact, well, in fact. And that's what, what your fee is for. Yeah. Think. Yeah. In fact, what is the role of the architect? Well, uh, we start very early in the early planning, just like we've been, we've been helping uh, with. Once the design starts, then uh, we actually would always suggest a committee be formed that, that the superintendent mentioned. <coughs> we would help them go through the actual design, and that means looking at several different options. We've already looked at, um, as you were presenting it, I was trying to think in my mind, I think we looked at four or five different ways of laying the buildings out. Those conceptual plans were done only to be sure that that property was big enough to put the, to put the buildings on. 
So that design process, which does take a couple of months, once we finish with that, we go into what we call construction documents, which is the very involved uh, process of, of documenting, drawing, everything, down to I mean, lots of times when uh, when I'm explaining what, what an architect does. Well, if you pick that door, for example, we have to specify what the door's made of, what size it is, uh, what color you want it to be, what the hardware is going to be on there. You can see the, the closure there. How many hinges are going to be on that door? And so on. It gets very, very involved. If we don't, then the contractor doesn't know how to bid. And so he'll put in a bid uh, that uh, won't be as precise as it should be. And so that construction document phase is very intensive, a lot of man hours. Architect is responsible for that, as well as uh, coordinating with the engineers. Once we go through construction, we help the, uh, the school district bid it. That's a, usually a one month process where we release it to uh, interested contractors where they will uh, put bids in to do that work. Uh, once one of the contractors is selected and it goes into construction, uh, then we're there all along the way acting as the owner's rep uh, from the very very start of the entire process to when the keys are turned over to the, to the district. <coughs> Hope that helped. That's, that's what we do. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. John, this doesn't concern the bottom, but I've been around people that have been telling Are we getting $10 million from Tenaris this year? No, sir. Okay. We're getting $8.6 million. Okay. Now, and what is that money for? Okay. That's okay. I, that money is called a revenue protection amount. Because we have a Chapter 313 agreement with Tenaris, okay? I guess i got to get out of the camera face. Because we have an agreement with Tenaris, today, their values, or this year, their values are being held down at $10 million, right, for the agreement. But with schools, which is different from what counties and cities do, they have to make us whole again. They can't hurt us whenever we do that for them. So by us doing that, it lowers. So here's your budget last year. Here's your budget this year. They have to bring us back up to here. So the difference between here and here because of that break is 8.6. And so that brings us back up. So that's not money we can just go out and, hey, let's go build a garage or let's go add on this over here. That's to keep our operating budget where it's supposed to. And so that's that's where it is. It's, it's our day-to-day -day running. And so honestly, in all honesty, right now, we're running <coughs> on fumes until February 1st because they're supposed to make their payment on January 31st, 2018. And that's what that is. And it's called a revenue protection payment. Exactly what it says. It helps the revenue get back up to where it's supposed to be. So it's not, it's not money we can play with. Okay? Good question. Any other questions? Hey, John, what's the timeline for when this, if this bond passes? What the, would be the timeline for construction? Well, and, and that's something that would happen in the design phase if, if the bond passes. But there's, there's a lot of different things that could happen relatively soon. Uh, things like the stands at the football field or the elementary school could be part of that once it goes through the design phase. Could be part of that because it can be built while this school is still in place. Okay, And then parts of the high school could be built while school is still going on. Middle school could be built while school's going on. And so there's some things that can happen while school's going on, and some things going to have to happen in the summertime or possibly with some portables. We're trying real hard to not have portables, you know, to make things happen. And with middle school, that should be relatively easy because we have a campus over on the other side of town. We can keep running while that's happening. But there's some places where we might have to do some of those things. But as far as an actual timeline, uh, I would say probably anywhere from two to three years. I was about to say, when you start the process, depending upon the school, an elementary school will take you about 18 months, uh, middle school will take you uh, a little bit longer. So, yeah, that's right on the head. Yeah, between two and three years before everything is complete. Some things are going to happen very quick because they need to happen very quick for, for safety. <clears throat> You're talking about actual when the construction starts in the middle school, 18 months or? No, that, that's when everything would be finished. And, and I'm kind of including. Uh, you know, the design phase, the construction documents, like I mentioned, bidding, 
Uh, and there is some phasing FD, but, but the real nice way about the way this plan is laid out is that you can, you can build the new schools without affecting the existing schools. There's a little bit of phasing that's going to have to be done, but in essence it works pretty clean like that. Um, if you saw that scheme about the elementary school, as <coughs> you'll notice that it fits right beside the new school. And that's intentional. That way you can build a new and then take down the old once the kids are moved into the new. That red line, that's mm -hmm. the old elementary school. Yeah. So you would, you would have them back here. If you didn't have that phasing issue, I mean, you know, you could easily put it up uh, in the front corner like this, the school is now facing the street. But then where are the kids going to go to school while we're building? <coughs> so that's, that's why we're... And also, also understand, too, when you talk about time frame, is we want to get the most construction done at the same time for cost. For the same. And so the better the scheduling is done during the design <coughs> phase, we want to do that because that saves us money. You know, if, if you got bricklayers coming you know, one day, it'd be nice to have them on the other school the next week. Yeah, you know? yeah so, there is, there's definitely an advantage of uh, quantity of work. Um, if you have, let's, you know, we're talking about three buildings. If they were built separately by three different companies, for example, which they could, then we could expect a, a, a square foot cost of so much. But if they're packaged together to where a larger company uh, might bid on it, and then the subcontractors within now have more brick, more concrete, and so on, your pricing is going to get better. And, and another important thing about, you know, with, with the design phase and your construction manager and those things, when they go out for bids, they're not just, they're not going out for bids in Houston <coughs> or Dallas or Fort Worth. You know, they're putting in folks from around here, too, that can do concrete work and things of that nature, that if their skill level is to that level that we need, <coughs> you know, that's, that's important. We definitely want to use folks that we can see every day, you know. Yes, sir. Last question. On Bill, everybody in Texas builds flat roof school. <laughs> <laughs> Worst invention ever made by man. Yes, sir. Or do we have plans to put some kind of pitch on? Yeah, I, I got. Let me tell you my story. Um, <laughs> it, that is asked every time we go into a design project, and and I will say there was a time. Now it was literally in the '60s when the, the thought was, if you built a dead flat roof and it rains, water will find the way out. Now, technically, that's Into true. Into a classroom. You know, well, well, no. But if it's, if it's dead flat, if water hits it, then it will find its way to the exterior of the building outside and go down. That's in theory. What made that not really good as you go through, through the years is settlement, and so on, and the, begins, it, the building begins to do this. And so when the water hits it, now it no longer finds that edge because it's not dead flat, because it, it's in kind of a bowl. That's the fallacy of a flat roof design. Now, just because you're standing on, uh, in front of a building and you see that straight line of the roof edge, doesn't mean that the actual roof is flat. <coughs> um, there are advantages on really, really large buildings. You know, you just can't put a sloped roof because you'll have three or four stories of attic space above it. So you have to do what's called um, a, a sloped roof with internal roof drains. But I will tell you this, and as long as we've been doing this, I've been doing this for 32 years at PBK, and that is there's no such thing as a flat roof. If, 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 a, if one of the kids that likes a skateboard were to go up on that on our roofs, they would love it because there's so much slopes going to roof drains to make sure that that, that water won't just drizzle into a flat roof. So, so yeah, uh, do we do flat roofs? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No, no, no. Um, but do they sometimes do they look like it when you're looking up at the building because you see that straight line? Yeah, that, that, that is true. Um, so you say, I say that, so depending upon the layout of that, in fact, that building right there is, has a pretty big footprint. So we couldn't necessarily do the pitch roof with, uh, you know, metal or whatever, like a house, for example. Uh, but we'll make sure that it's, it's not a flat roof. It'll have, it'll have a lot of slope. And, and that particular building now, if you were to stand on one corner of it and look across it, standing on the roof, it does look almost flat. 
but the, that's a 1970s design too. So that's one of the things yeah. that they've come up with. Have y'all seen the uh, George Ranch High School in Lamar Consolidated? Mm -hmm. There you go. So that's our that's one of our buildings. And that's absolutely what they said. They said, we want a slow groove. So I was just about to qualify and say, can you do a slow groove? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And George Ranch is a good example. One more question. Will, it, will those drains hold 32 inches of water? Like we just got through going through this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wasn't that amazing? I, tell you, I, I, I live in Sugarland, and yeah, we had uh, 50, was it 54 inches in two, three days? Um, I'm also helping some school districts over in the Beaumont area. They got 67 inches in two days. And um, so uh, there are a lot of strict requirements to make sure code-wise that, you know, everything is safe in the building. So I, it's hard to say, you know, is, is that answer yes, but I'll tell you how we do it. Uh, I need something to write on. I'm, I'm, I'm an architect, but okay. So, so if, you, if you figure the, uh, the exterior wall, and then I told about the roof drains that usually three or four feet in from the exterior wall is, is your first roof drain. And it slopes down towards that from the outside wall and then turns and goes back up. Um, the roof is designed to where regular rains, it slopes, goes down the roof drain and so on. But when you get a real frog strangler like we do a lot, it'll go up and over the exterior wall. So in the case of a ton of rain coming in, and that roof drain can't handle all the rain, it's designed to go right back up and over the side of the, uh, of the building. So, so with that kind of design, it'll handle any amount of rain that you have. Any other questions? Okay. I, again, greatly appreciate you coming tonight. Uh, if you would like to walk around the building, Ms. Roper and the other principals will be happy to show you around. And uh, if you're good with not doing that, that's fine too. But if you'd like to, Ms. Rope would be happy to show you around. I'll show you around too as well. And then if you want to, you know, if you think of something later in the week or next week or whatever, and you have a question, give me a call. Call me anytime you need to. Very simple number to remember, 323-5001. Just call up here and I'll be more than happy to sit with you. If you want to come walk around the school while there's kids here so you can see what the kids have to deal with, I'll be more than happy to show you around then too as well. So again, early voting started today. It goes for two weeks. Okay, it starts at 8 a.m. and ends at 5 p.m. for the next two weeks. It's not on the weekend. And then the actual election day is on November 7th. So again, like I said earlier, I can't ask you to vote no. I can't ask you to vote yes. But I can ask you to please get out and vote. And if you have any questions, please don't <coughs> to call. All right, thank you. Very much.